Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, Senior Editor at Food & Wine, and my guest today is Kwame Onwachi, who is... Oh, so many things. Um, a Food & Wine Best New Chef in 2019, James Beard Award winner for Rising Star Chef. He wrote an incredible memoir, Notes from a Young Black Chef, that is being turned into a movie. You may have known him from Top Chef. I have been really lucky enough in the past couple of years to have known him as all these things and also a friend. Um, and... Uh, you know, we're everybody's going through an intensely difficult time right now. I don't care who you are. Um, the global pandemic is affecting you in some ways. And uh, restaurants are being especially hit hard right now. Um, this, so many people I love have had to lay off their staffs. They've had to face challenges that they never could have anticipated. And... It, I can, it can seem really, really bleak. Um, the, the light in all of this has been seeing the people who step up as, as the helpers, as the, as the leaders, as the, the people who are taking concrete measures to make sure that there is a future for restaurants. And Kwame has emerged as one of the voices um, in that with his, his work with the uh, Independent Restaurant Coalition and the way he's taking care of his um, team at Kith and Kin and just being a great and, and positive voice out there in the world. Um, so we had a, a call and talked about all of these things and also about the disproportionate impact that all of this is having on communities of color and what can be done to uh, to help everybody and especially the people who are voiceless. Um, so let's get into it with Kwame. Kwame, how you doing? Uh, you know. <laughs> Give me the real answer if you don't mind. Um it depends on the day, you know. I have these this roller coaster of emotions right now, and I, I try to stay positive throughout it all. Um, worried about my team, worried about the industry, and um, yeah, I mean, some days are better than others. Yeah. And the the craziest part is, you know, I think most of us in this food and beverage industry, journalism, like we're we're task oriented, so it's like. All right, or maybe you can get through something if I know when this thing will be over with, but I have no idea when. So yeah, that, that doesn't give me a lot of um, of hope. No, and and that's the thing is like you know we we're always told like look for the helpers, look for the leaders, look for all of that uh, stuff, and no one has any experience with this whatsoever. Uh, the restaurant industry has certainly not been through this before. But my, my colleague. Um, Margaret Ebi has this great tattoo, and she said, "If you can't find the mayor, you must be the mayor." And I think you became a mayor uh, really quickly. I, <laughs> um, I appreciate that. That's a, a heavy, heavy crown. I have, I have great people around me. You know, um, great leaders to follow as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, I'm just trying to do what I. If I can with, you know, whatever platform I have, um, you know, but ultimately I just want, um, you know, repre- restaurants to be representative and I want to do something useful with my yeah. time, you know. Um, You're a doer. So. <laughs> you just, you are. <laughs> I mean, in the, in the time that I've known you. You know, I see. I, I've seen you grow as a leader in in such a beautiful and organic uh, kind of way, and I've also seen the pressure that that uh, puts on you. And um, so, mm-hmm. I, you know, I want to hit on a few different things because I want to talk about what you're doing with the IRC, but I also really want to talk about. Um, what you brought up on this conference call yesterday with some other industry leaders about how the lines of representation are falling in this. And you you said something that really stood out to me about uh, it being your goal to represent the inaudible. And you, you know, you're a proud son of the Bronx, and which is being hit so hard. Exactly. Can you talk about what you're seeing, uh, you know, it, where where you grew up? Um, you know, just the number of cases and not even just the number of cases, the number of yeah. fatalities within those cases, you know, it goes back to, you know, 
for me, it equates to like incarceration levels. You know, there's a lower population of African Americans, but a higher population mm -hmm. of them in prison. You know, there's a lower population of African Americans or you know minorities, um, but there's a higher population of them dying. You know, I think in Chicago, I think it's seventy percent of all the deaths have been African American or, or minority. Um, in the Bronx, is three times as likely for someone in the Bronx who's contracted coronavirus to perish than it is for someone just across the river in Manhattan. Um, <laughs> but yet you have tigers getting tests and they're saying, we don't have enough tests, you know? And it's like, um, I can use my platform and it's easy for someone to look at me and be like, oh, you're, you know, you have a, you have your own restaurant you, you've, you know, worked in Michelin star kitchens, you've won awards, like, what do you mean, you know, people, there, there's not extreme equality. If, if you are not the poster mm -hmm. child for that, then, then who is? And, you know, what I say to that is, you know, just because I've gone through these things doesn't mean that they don't exist. Just because I have the mental dexterity to continue to push through doesn't mean that it's not happening to other people. Um, and when you look at coronavirus, I mean, you can just look at the numbers and see that there's something off, you know, and I don't know if that's because mm -hmm. it's easier for people to social distance because they can work at home uh, and in these, you know, other um, areas or um, or if, you know, there isn't health care provided for for most of these people when they find out it's too late. I'm not a scientist, you know, but I can look at numbers and see that there is some sort of misrepresentation. Um, yeah. I mean, I was looking uh, yesterday, sorry to uh, cut you off. I was reading a piece by uh, Charles Blau in the Times and he was talking about the kinds of jobs uh, and the distribution of the kinds of jobs and the statistics that it was, it was black and brown people basically mm -hmm. and saying that fewer than one in five black workers has a uh, a job that uh, can be done from home. Exactly. Uh, you, know. Um, you know, last time I was on there, we talked about, you know, my my um, childhood friend, Jay Kwan, uh, you know, he passed away yeah. um, from gun violence. And I've stemmed uh, a relationship with his son, you know, since then. And, and I talked to the mother, um, the son's mother, and she has to go to work every single day. She's in, she's in healthcare, you know, and, and her job is, to watch the children of the healthcare of the doctors and, and things like that. So she cannot say no, you know, she can't yeah. work from home. And then, you know, she has to then go home and be around her son, which is problematic for obvious reasons, you know, and kudos to her. She's on the front lines, you know, um, making sure that these doctors can, can, um, go out there and perform and do God's work. But um, she's a representation of a lot of people in the Bronx that their, their jobs cannot be remote. You know, they're, they're like the restaurant industry. We can't work from home, you know? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's deeply personal to me. You know, um, I'm not saying I, I have all the answers, but I will talk about it and hopefully it'll make people think. And the people that can make the decisions will <sighs> That will ponder on this and also say, also know that it's being noticed, you know, whether I, I have all the scientific backing for it all, which I don't, you know, um, I went to school for other things, but I can still read between the lines and see the misrepresentation and see how, you know, people in, in the inner city are, are dying in, in astronomical numbers. And I think there's also a, a terror, a, you know, a gut level terror of, uh, you know, there's, it's zero secret that the restaurant industry and uh, its access to healthcare are, you know, beyond screwed up. Um, and I, and I, and I, uh -huh. there's such terror in people, you know, what happens if I go, if I feel sick enough that I go to a hospital and it's not covered because, some, you know, some restaurant groups are making this big show of, well, if you are affected by a coronavirus, if you have it and you get diagnosed, then you get whatever. The people are afraid to um, you even go and get treated because of the astronomical bills that they're afraid they're going to face. I, I was following a Twitter thread mm -hmm. that was somebody um, 
they were about to uh, to intubate somebody, and the last words this person was saying before they were intubated was like, you know, who's you know who's going to pay for this? And I, you know, and it could have been interpreted by who's going to pay for that, like in a revenge kind of way, but also who's going to freaking pay for this? And so, are you seeing exactly. in these conversations that you're having about uh, money for restaurants? Are you seeing? Money talk of money being allocated for you know current and future healthcare for workers. I know because right now we're just trying to focus on yeah. making sure the restaurants open up. There are definitely things within um, that we're trying to um, include for the longevity of restaurants um, and restructuring, you know, the the business model um, and making it more livable, you know, but part of that comes with changing the perspective of the restaurant industry and making it okay to charge a little bit more for, for something so that the workers get um, what they deserve. You know, we have incredible, we, we are overtaxed, overregulated mm-hmm. businesses by people who don't run our business. So we have a lot, part of the razor thin margins comes from all of the, all the taxation that happens on our profits. So, um, you know, that's something that down the line we're definitely thinking of. But right now, the immediate is let's focus on getting these restaurants back open and operating. Um, And then I don't think the Independent Restaurant Coalition is going to go anywhere. You know, I I like to joke and call it um, the Avengers of the restaurant industry. (laughs) I keep ma- I keep making Avengers references uh, to all this, like having our Avengers assemble uh, moment. I mean, you're a you know you're a, a food and wine best new chef class of 2019, and I, you know we're, we're I definitely feel like the Spider Man in in this because like everyone is so so accomplished. And I'm like the young the young guy trying to you know come in here and show that he he can he can contribute in, in any way that he can, and just happy to be there. So that, that's how I feel in this. Um, but yeah, it's the Avengers, you know, and we the I don't think there will always be things to fix. There will always be um, more battles to fight um, and things to advocate for. So that's what the coalition is for, you know, and I think it will uh, graduate into something bigger and um, and just more lasting within the industry that you can just all use our um, our platforms and our connections to make change, you know? And what we're focusing on right now is making sure that we have restaurants to even make change in, you know? Um, Cause that's, that's super, super important. Yeah. Well, I wanna, that. Yeah. I, I wanna say, first of all, I, I think of a, a Miles Morales, maybe. I think if we're going Spider-Man. <laughs> 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 Which I've always loved him so much, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Spider Man's incredibly important in uh, it, you know in the Avengers. He's you know he's yeah. he's our guy from the outer boroughs, <laughs> and he's really really important. That's me. That's I'm, me. I'm, I'm I'm Mantis uh, personally. I think, <laughs> but. Uh, but you're you're dealing so independent restaurant coalition. Um, I want to talk about what an independent restaurant is because I think there are a, a lot of different views about it. Because some people are looking to, you know, there's this conversation that looking to Danny Meyer, or looking to all these other people, and saying like, wait, you're not an independent restaurant. And like at the same time, these places actually technically are. So you're when you're talking about independent restaurants, it is a vast swath of things. It is everything. From a little, you know, a diner, a, a taco stand, a, you know, all of these things to a Danielle or, uh, you know, Le Bernadin or something. And and exactly. do you see that um, any of the sort of fine dining places were any more equipped to deal with this than the smaller places? Um, when you say smaller places, because a smaller place can be chef's mm-hmm. table at Brooklyn Fair, you know, that's only what. Yeah. 20 seats, you know, or Danielle has a hundred seats, probably a little bit more, you know? So, um, you know, small is relative, you know, if we're just talking fine dining and more casual, um, those can also mean, you know, two totally different things um, because some fine dining restaurants are still family owned. You think of, you know, um, Jesse Ito's restaurant, it's like him and his father, you think of Cato, you know, in, in, in LA. 
it's it's a, it's a family run restaurant. It is fine dining, but I think um, you know when we think of independent restaurants, an independent restaurant is just a restaurant that utilizes small purveyors. You know, um, helps with the local economy. Um, something that isn't a large corporation. Um, it's a, a restaurant um, that. Um, how can I best describe this? Um, it's it's not part of your, your your. We're not talking about McDonald's. We're not talking about Wendy's. You know, we're not talking about these these chain restaurants. You know, and I'm not saying that they don't need their own help. You know, that's that's not the point here. I'm just talking about restaurants. You know, um, that feed our communities in in a different way. So it's, it's, it's your smaller restaurants that, um, that, that just aren't on the, this like large scale. So they're, they're not these like national, international corporations that we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking a lot of my neighborhood restaurants and have been trying to support them in whatever way seems right right now, um, you know, and because people are not going to survive on delivery and takeout. I mean, that's, it's just, you know, that's not going to happen. It, it It's, you know, people are, they were, I think it's a great pivot for now and people can support um, in some ways, but then, you know, there's the ethical question of, okay, so you have somebody still in there having to leave their house and cook. You have, you know, purveyors having to to bring in food for that. And, you know, you have uh, delivery. Um, you know, I've been trying to go in and call call restaurants directly and pick up. But then I'm thinking, you know, is there something unethical or immoral about expecting that somebody else is going to make this this food? And I think a lot of people are caught on that right now. Like, what is the right thing for diners to be doing right There's now? There's no right or wrong answer. This is a national pandemic that everyone is figuring out on their own. You know what I mean? Um, as long as you're not putting someone at harm. Now, personally, I close, you know, more Kit than, Kit than Kin was closed because of, you know, we have 60 employees, you know, we don't want people to be at risk. I mean, we have employees that are at risk. We have people that are elderly um, and takeout doesn't work for us. But I can't look down on that mom and pop shop or that immigrant run restaurant where they're living out their American dream. And one, maybe they have been doing delivery this whole time anyway, or two, this is the only way that they can continue to survive, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. it's really case by case. This isn't, uh, this isn't a time to really point fingers and look down on people or say like, they should be doing this. So I'm not going to support that. Um, cause everyone is just trying to figure this out. And I'm just talking about what's yeah. needed in the restaurant industry. Other, other stuff is, you know, that's, that's a whole different story, but within the restaurant industry, we're trying to figure it out day by day, you know, and we're trying to make the best decisions for, for business, for our staff, for longevity. And whatever decision you're making, you know, either stand by that or do a little bit more research and do what you feel is right for you. Yeah. I mean, I I, uh, I keep thinking about this so much and, and hearing people say, well, why didn't this chef do that? Why didn't that chef do that? And nobody had a plan. Nobody was, uh, was, was prepared for this whatsoever. And I see a lot of sort of anger and finger pointing. And I understand that that is what people do when they're scared because everybody is going through this. Everybody is touched by it. You know, uh, it's, it's taken a little bit, a little while for, I think a lot of us to sort out like what are the sort of tent pole organizations that are in there and, and uh, helping out. And I think the IRC, has emerged, I think, uh, as, as a really important one. Um, there's Roar in New York. There are efforts in San Francisco. I, I've been thinking that it's going to be a combination of some of these national efforts and then a lot of grassroots community stuff that is, is happening. Um, what are you seeing this? Where should people be putting their attention so far as you're concerned? Um, you know, obviously, I'm with the Independent Restaurant Coalition. So, like, that's a great you know, um, flagpole speaking for, for all, but all of these, you know, um, coalitions or movements are, we're all representing the same thing, you know? So feel free to, whether it's your local one and there's, you know, there's, there's a DC coalition, there's Chicago, there's Roar, there's Big, there's, there's all different types and they're all trying to attain the same goal which is to make sure that we are still here when this is all said and done.
So um, whatever one you feel comfortable with, go for it. You know, as long as you're evoking positivity um, and e emitting, you know, um, solidarity so that we can have an industry when this is all said and done, I'm all for it. You know, we've been talking a lot because, uh, you know, we have the 2020 Best New yeah. Chef class is uh, is coming up and, you know, this is unprecedented and you were, you know, present for the mentorship that we uh, did last year and we're trying to figure out how to do it for them this year because it's, you know, it's uh, with, with them and with our Best New Restaurants, it's, it's coming into an unprecedented uh, time <laughs> from before. So we're trying to figure out sort of how best to support and advise and I, I just I keep coming back to what you said about representing, um, you know, being a representative of the inaudible. So when this money comes down, um, you know, we've been saying what we want to communicate to the best new chefs is, uh, you know, we're asking people, you know, when we th we're thinking about a knife roll and you have the essentials in there, what are the essentials you move forward with? What is the stuff that gets left in in the past and just trying to figure out what is really important when this money comes down? and restaurants reopen or rebuild, what do we need to do to ensure that communities of color are given a slice of the pie of, of that money? Um, because historically, you know, it's been really, really hard for you know, immigrants, women, people of color to get money to open restaurants. Um, is there, do you see that in this sort of new moving forward, that there's going to be a shift of that existing paradigm? And how can diners make sure that that is the case moving forward? I don't think there'll be a shift. I mean, quite frankly, because the, um, you know, the parameters that are put in place to even attain some of these, you know, grants or loans, um, they favor the people that have, you um, uh, lots of support, essentially, you know, if you have all of your, uh, you know, taxes in line and um, you're current on on pretty much everything, then you're eligible for all of this. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, minorities and women and things and people of color aren't current on all of that. But I, I just feel that um, it's it's going to be harder for the smaller you know, family run places to provide all of that um, and be eligible for the whole package um, moving forward. You know, I don't have I don't have the answers. I also don't have the money. So, like, I feel like, you know, we should we need to start directing some of this to the people that to the powers that be, you know, um, that have the access to to capital or access to um providing, you know, lots of platforms and, and backing um, to direct their efforts and to spread their efforts uh, across the board, you know, so everyone is, is represented. But, um, you know, I think when we do get back into this, we're going to have to really think about our business models and um, make sure that we do have funds um, kept away so we don't run into these situations where we are on the brink of, you know, destroying an industry or not seeing it. part of this pandemic is destroying the industry. Not It's not a, a fault to ours, but I think we just need to be more, more prepared, you know, as business owners um, for situations, for unfortunate situations. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I keep thinking about the, there is a 24 hour, you know, diner coffee shop up the street from me that, you know, I go to right. once a week or so. And I think they're, they're doing delivery, but I was thinking there's, they're a cash business. You can't mm -hmm. use a credit card there. There's no way, you know, they're running to the bank, um, you know, throughout the day. And, you know, and, and I'm, I'm thinking like, if you're a business that just is floating cash constantly, you know, there's no way that you have a bunch socked away and that's going to take some like, you know, rich ass person who lives in my neighborhood <laughs> to, uh, yeah. I've, I've lived in this neighborhood for, a. Uh, 
you know, uh, I moved here because it was cheap at the time. And luckily, I've been luck- lucky enough to have my rent locked in for a pretty long time. But there's some incredibly rich people here. But I need some like stockbroker or something like that to go and bail out 7th Avenue Donuts. So because it's been around yeah. for, God, I think since the 20s or 30s or something like that. I could be getting that wrong, but it's been around for decades. In addition to your own restaurant, what is the local place near you that you hell or high water want to see succeed? Um, El Riconcito. So a little El Salvadorian place um, in DC. Um, Los Hermanos. It's a um, Dominican spot. I really, really like um, Share Share, this Ethiopian restaurant. You know, I want to see all of these places succeed. Um, Kane, you know, restaurant by Peter Prime. He building a lot of momentum, you know, and these these type of restaurants I, I would like to see succeed as well as all of, you know, countless other ones, you know, um, uh, Carly Steiner, Pom Pom and, you know, Eric Brunner Yang, all of his restaurants. I want to see everyone succeed, you know. Um, the small immigrant run places, you know, those are near and dear to my heart. One, because, you know, those are places <laughs> I like to eat at on, you know, every day. And two, you know, those are the restaurants that feed America, you know, the the pulse of America. People that do the things that you don't want to do, you know, and keep America going. So I I hold those places, you know, near and dear to my heart. Yeah. And you have a GoFundMe for um, your team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a GoFundMe for my team, um, just so they if so they can see a glimmer of hope, you know, um, and let them know that we're thinking about them. Yeah, and what are you? I ask you this question a lot. What, <laughs> what are you doing to take care of yourself? I'm actually working out a lot. I read that really like three times a day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's keeping me sane. It's giving me a sense of purpose because you know I like to stay busy and not come up for a breath ever, you know, and it gives me this sense of purpose um, just like completing, you know, a workout every single day and eating really healthy um, and trying not to just like overindulge. So. Yeah. So this is how uh, Spider Man or Miles Morales like morphs into Thor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Oh my gosh. And uh, I want to ask you also something that I've been asking people on Twitter and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. Have you noticed that you're like locking your jaw up or that you're like lifting up your shoulders too high or like any of these kind of things. I've been trying to get people to like have this thing unclench a clock so they can just like soften their muscles. Cause I, I mean, I've, I've been pretty good. Honestly, the workout is very meditative for me. So it's kind of like a form of meditation. Um, I do have my days though that yeah. I'm so stressed out and I have my most within the day like my fiance would hear me like sigh she'd be like what's going on i'd be like i just don't know when this is gonna end like when am i gonna get back i need to be around people you know and um those moments come you know and we need to let those moments pass sometimes um and recognize them for what they are that they're feelings and we're human and we have them and hopefully the next wave of emotions will be happiness you know and we'll embrace that fully so I try to, I try to, you know, use uh, my workouts as meditation right now. Yeah. And uh, I think to, to wrap it up, um, I've seen, you know, in, in Facebook groups and, and uh, you know, other places where I'm talking to chefs, um, some of them actually for the first time in their entire, you know, adult lives or in their working lives are having time to, to sleep and connect with people and be a person. And they, you know, and I've asked, how's your self care? And they've said actually better than it has ever been. And, but other people are saying, you know, what is he, what does it even matter anymore? Um, the world is ending. Everything is over. Why, why don't I just, you know, engage in some really self harmful behavior? Do you have any words of hope uh, for, for those restaurant workers who are currently, 
you know, they're so used to being just, they've given up everything else in their lives to go and work in restaurants. And all of a sudden they, you know, don't have those support systems around them because they, you know, didn't have time to foster them. And they're just, you know, sitting at home and worried about money and they don't have that usual routine. Do you have some words of hope for them? Yeah. Um, I would say find someone you can talk to. It could just be one person, you know, um, I have a friend that's kind of going through it. He's in Hong Kong. And I don't know if you know about Hong Kong, but they've been dealt a really bad hand, you know, these past six or seven months, you know, started with the riots, you know, and then it started with coronavirus and then coronavirus, you know, went through and then it came back, you know, and their food and beverage industry has hit really, really hard. Um, and I check in, you know, and he checks in on me and makes sure that, that I'm okay. And just having that one person that you can just just talk to, just say hey to, you know, once a day and see what they're doing. But also just remind yourself that us as human beings, we are extremely resilient and we will get through anything. You know, we, we talk on cell phones and go to the moon. Like we're, we're going to get through this, you know, um, and it's hard to see uh, the future or even have a, a moment of um, of just a moment of like understanding that this will be okay, but just take it one day at a time, let emotions pass, take care of yourself. You know, um, you don't have to come out of this with a new skill or a newfound purpose and don't have that kind of pressure. Be okay with not knowing what you're going to do next, because it doesn't happen that often, especially us in the restaurant industry or very task orientated and we like know exactly what's happening next when we quit a job we already have staged at another place so we we know what's going on there's a beauty in like not knowing what you're doing next and letting kind of like the universe take control and know that you're not in control and there's this saying you know and it's clearly um um like uh it's just it's a it's just a metaphor you know you don't have to be religious you know because i'm not but man plans and <laughs> yeah. god laughs you know so just be okay with that and just take it a day at a time and know that we're all in this together the whole world and we'll get through this if you were there in the room with me i would reach out i would lock pinkies with you again <laughs> and uh yes. and I can't. Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I can't wait to be in her. I, I would lock pinkies with you and we would promise to, to get through this um, and, and to, and to breathe and stuff. But friend, I cannot wait to hug you again. And, and I, hearing your voice on I these, can't. you know, all this stuff has just been a, a, a balm and a joy. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been, it's, I never thought I would be, you know, advocating for, you know, a restaurant rights or anything, but it feels right. You know, it feels like the right thing to do. And I'm, I'm just honored and grateful to have this platform to talk about these issues um, that are near and dear to my heart. So thank you as well for having me on. My friend, you deserve, you deserve to be on that platform and I'm grateful for you. Thank you so much to our guest today, Kwame Onwachi. And please, uh, we'll include the links to the Kith and Kin GoFundMe to uh, saverestaurants.co, where you can join forces with other people in the industry who are fighting for the future of restaurants. This work is so important and it needs absolutely everybody involved in it. And, you know, we, we finished out the end, uh, you know, talking about you know, calming down some and, 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 you know, some self care. And I really hope that anybody listening to this is able to give themselves a moment and step away from the news, step away from whatever is stressing you out right now. And just take this moment, relax your jaw, drop your shoulders. Um, if you like me or a person who bites or picks at your skin, give yourself a break, give that skin some time to heal, give you some time to heal. Um, the harder we are on our bodies during this time, the less strength that we will have for the, the fight ahead. It's okay to relax. It is okay to sleep. It is okay to 
you know, stop and do something joyful. We have to remember that that exists and that there is something worth fighting for. Um, it's easy to get trapped in the, the walls of wherever you are right now and forget that there is a world outside of this that has hope in it, that has nature, that has other people, that has all the things that we care about. Um, there is a future. There, there is. We don't know what it's going to look like right now, but there is one. And I am so grateful to all the people who are helping right now and please please keep yourself well <laughs> and be able to enjoy that and be part of it i want to also thank um our incredible team here um jennifer martnick margot Gotthelf, and helly tarpley who all work on the audio side and sarah crowder our photo editor they've been nimble they've been incredible they're all working from home and still making this all come together. And I'm so grateful for them and to all of my Food & Wine co-workers on a regular basis. And uh, if you're not acquainted with Food & Wine Pro, now is a absolutely perfect time for that because we are sharing as many resources as we can with the restaurant industry, um, stories of all the efforts that being that are being made, stories of hope, and uh, just really sharing what people are going through right now and ways that everybody can help and, and get involved. And you can go there at foodandwine.com slash fwpro. It's a section in the magazine every month as well um, as in-person events. And I just hope everybody can take part in that. There is also the Food and Wine Pro newsletter that uh, comes out every week. You can sign up on the, the Food and Wine Pro uh, page. And it is written by our mighty editor-in-chief, Hunter Lewis, uh, with help from Osette Babur, our uh, our associate restaurant editor, and um, some words from me and from our uh, incredible associate uh, food editor, Kelsey Youngman, who is a certified meditation instructor and offers words of wisdom uh, every week to help people out through this difficult time. So thank you so much for listening. Um, if you can, hey, I hate asking anybody for anything right now, but... If you can rate, review those stars, those comments really help us move up in the uh, rankings on Apple Podcasts and various other places so more people can hear this and so we get to keep doing it. And I'd be so grateful if you would do that. And most importantly, take good care of yourself until the next time. <laughs>